We're about to begin the funeral service. We ask for those that have a cell phone or pager, if you could turn it to the silent mode. For those that will speak, will be speaking through Zoom, we're going to unmute you when it's your turn to speak. Otherwise, there's a lot of back, uh, back noise and echo coming through the sound system. So we're going to begin the service with Rabbi Axler. And we can gather under the tent. Our Jewish funeral service begins with the Kriya, or tearing the black ribbon. It's a custom that dates back to two biblical moments. First, when Jacob saw what he thought was the blood of Joseph on his coat of many colors, our Torah says that he tore his clothes. And then many years later, when King David learned that his eldest son, Avshalom, had been killed, in his grief he fell to the floor and also tore his clothes. So this expression of tearing has been part of our Jewish funeral service now for over 3,000 years. And the external tearing has come to symbolize the broken fabric and the broken hearts in our lives. Noah and Zach, if you would tear your ribbon. Okay. And Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam dayan ha-met. O blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who is the one judge of all truth. God saw you getting tired when a cure was not to be. So he wrapped his arms around you and he whispered, come to me. You didn't deserve what you went through, so he gave you rest. God's garden must be beautiful because he only takes the best. And when I saw you sleeping so peaceful and free from pain, I could not wish you back to suffer that again. She is gone, and you can shed tears that she is gone, or you can smile because she has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that she will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that she has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see her, or you can be full of the love that you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember her and only that she is gone, or you can cherish her memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind and be angry and turn your back, or you could do what she would want, smile, open your eyes, love, and go on. At times like this, words fail us, and so we turn to our psalms, and please join me if you can in the 23rd psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Eshet Chayil Miimsa, this is Proverbs 31. A woman of valor who can find, she is more precious than fine pearls. She perceives that her labor is rewarding and her candle burns on into the night. She reaches out to those in need and she extends her hands to the poor. She is clothed in strength and dignity and she faces the future cheerfully. She speaks with wisdom and the law of kindness is on her lips. Her family rise up and they bless her and they sing her praises. Many daughters have done valiantly, but you excel them all. A life well lived cannot be diminished by death. The beauty, the guidance, and the inspiration it gave us will shine on as brightly as ever. Those we love remain part of us. Our loved ones leave the world, but never our hearts. Corinne is part of who you are, of how you see the world, 
of how you live and give, and those priceless gifts are yours forever. There is a beautiful Midrash, or Jewish legend, that relates the following story. Two ships were once seen near land. One of them was leaving the harbor and the other was coming into it. Everyone was cheering the outgoing ship, giving it a hearty send-off. But the incoming ship was scarcely noticed. A wise man standing nearby offered this comment. Rejoice not, he said, over the ship that is setting out to sea. For you know not what destiny awaits it, what storms it may encounter, what dangers lurk before it. Rather rejoice over the ship that has reached port safely and brought back all of its passengers in peace. It is the way of the world that when a human being is born, all rejoice. But when she dies, all, so all sorrow. Maybe it should be the other way around. No one can tell what trouble awaits the developing child on its journey through life. But when a woman has lived well and dies in peace, all should rejoice, for she has completed her journey successfully and is departing from this world with the imperishable crown of a good name. The way our dear Corky lived her life, she earned and deserved our people's most highest honor, the Kesher, Kesher Shem Tov, the crown of a good name. There's a beautiful Hasidic saying that when one passes away, we mourn in three ways. We mourn in tears, we mourn in silence, and we mourn with song. Family and friends are mourning with tears. We are all mourning in the silence of our hearts. But we are here this afternoon to commemorate and celebrate the joyous and wonderful song that was the life of our dear Corinne Quirky Dropkin. In describing the passing of our first matriarch, Sarah, our Torah says that Sarah lived to be 127 years old. And what the Torah doesn't say is that Sarah died at 127, but that Sarah lived to be 127 underscoring that what is most important in life is how we live and not how we die. Corky lived a wonderful life of love for her husband, Alan, of 53 years. And you know, rabbis have this thing that's called gematria, where we place a numerical value to each Hebrew letter. And three is a gimel, and 50 is a nun. And if you put the two together, it spells the Hebrew word gan, garden. And their marriage certainly was a garden of love. She lived a life of love for her parents, Manny and Trudy. A life of love for her children, Ruth and David, Zachary and Pam, Noah and Lisa. A life of love as Bubby to her grandchildren, Matthew, Jessica and Michael, Ari and Alex, Avigail and Robbie. Tamar, Eric, and Emily, Alex, Michael, Lily, and Tate. A life of love for her seven great-grandchildren. A life of love for her brother, Bert. A life of love for her extended family and her many friends. I remember being so excited 20 years ago or so when Maureen and I got the phone call inviting us to our first Shabbat dinner with Corky and Alan. We felt like we had made it. We were finally being welcomed, you know, by the Lakeshore Drive community. And more than 20 years later and more than many Shabbat dinners later, Corky being the great hostess and cook that she was, it was very clear to me that Corky Dropkin had the right recipe for life. And the main ingredient in that recipe was the love she had for her family, the love she had for her friends and her community, and the unbe unbelievable zest she had for life. Our tradition teaches us that when we pass on, 
we leave behind only two things. And they are two Hebrew words that not only sound alike, but they come from the same root. One is Yerusha, and the other is Morisha. Now Yerusha are your material assets. They're your bank accounts, or your real estate holdings, or your stocks and bonds. But Morisha is the essence of who you are. The characteristics about yourself that you leave behind for family and friends who love you and who will miss you. I don't know, nor do I care to know what Corky Jerusha was, but I can tell you what her Morisha was. It was an unconditional love for her family. It was a reaching out and caring for others. And it was a zest for life. In the very first words of the Torah, it says, let there be light. And there was light. But it wasn't until day four that God creates the sun and the moon. So if God creates the sun and the moon on day four, what was this light that God was talking about in the very first sentences? So I believe that light was the light of God. And since the world wasn't complete, God put that light into each and every one of us. And when we lead good lives and when we care for others, that light shines forth and makes the world better. Every single person here knew that Corky Dropkin had that light. And when it shone forth and hit you, it inspired you to do better and to be better. In the drive on the way up, a song came over the radio that touched my heart and reminded me of our service today. It was a 1960s hit song by Burt Backrack and Hal David. Always something there to remind me. Each one of us will always have a special moment, a special experience, a special something that will always remind us of Corinne Corky Dropkin. For as the song concludes, for how can I forget you when there is always something there to remind me? I was born to love you and I will never be free because you'll always be a part of me. Corky's song may be over, but the melody of her life and her love lingers on. Her passing cannot diminish the important ways that she touched our lives. And our grief cannot take away the happiness that we shared with her. In our memories of her, may we all find comfort. In our family and friends, may we find love. And in our hearts, may we find the strength to help us through this very difficult time. So may the memory of Corinne Corky Dropkin always be a blessing to us. May it inspire us to do better and to be better. Zach, Noah, Ruth, David, in her honor, may God grant you peace and comfort during this very difficult time. Amen. So for more than 20 years, Maureen had formed a very special bond and friendship with Corky. And on behalf of all the people whose lives she touched and made better, I know Maureen wants to say a few words. Not easy following my husband. <laughs> I am humbled and honored to speak about Corrine Dropkin on behalf of her Lakeshore Drive Synagogue family. Corky, as we affectionately called her, was colorful and creative. She was generous and gracious, productive and proud, stylish and smart. And most of all, Corky Dropkin was full of love for Alan, for family, for knitting, for synagogue, for entertaining, and for life. Corky was the grand dame of Elm Street Synagogue. We looked forward to seeing her in her latest sweater and accessories that matched every Shabbat. Though reluctant to move to Milwaukee, she made new friends and boyfriends. When she came back for a visit, 
It was comforting to see Corky in her usual seat, taking a few breaks, and then holding court at the kiddush. Corky gave so much more than she received. What a treat it was to be part of that large and eclectic group on her, at her Shabbat dinners. She delivered halas and wine to patients at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. The number of cards she sent to friends for their birthdays, their anniversaries, and other occasions could fill a Hallmark card store. I know we're thinking today of how much we owed Corky a dinner, a card, even a call. We can't reciprocate now. So instead, let's do a few acts of kindness in her memory. She'd appreciate that. And now it's my honor to call upon lifelong friend, Dr. Skolnick. Corky's passing marks the end of an era of unique friendship between two couples, Corky and Alan Dropkin, and Vivian and Herb Skolnick, and their respective families. It is almost impossible to express in words how deeply Corky felt and expressed the meaning of our special relationship. Our home is literally a treasure house of innumerable mementos of every shape and description sent to us to commemorate special events in our lives. From the time we first met at Congregation Road Tzedek in 1953, when I was hired as principal of its religious school, and they were parents of very young children, our relationship began to develop. This professional relationship turned into a more personal one when we became neighbors in High Park, a short distance from the University of Chicago in 1960. During that time, there was a sharing of the special assets and the lifestyle of our families. They benefited in their coming closer to the richness of our religious way of life. And I learned from Alan's lay leadership in synagogue and community affairs, especially when Alan became the president of the Chicago Board of Jewish Education. Alan, an only child, often said that he felt that I was his adopted brother. On the children's level, there began a corresponding learning and social relationship. This is but a brief historical snapshot of our friendship but it was really in the social area where our lives really intersected. The Dropkins led a very active social life, mainly because of Corky's gregariousness, especially memorable, as was mentioned before, were the lavish Friday night Shabbat dinners on Lake Shore Drive, when Corky and Alan hosted single pre-law and pre-legal students, mostly from out of town, so they could have a Shabbat experience together. Whenever there was a family simcha, Corky always spoke and delivered beautiful re uh, greetings about the people who were attending. After Alan's death, Corky always managed to travel no matter where it was, even though it was difficult for her, in order to participate in our family's simchas. That is why, when Ruth informed us of Corky's passing, it caused a deep emotional rip in our hearts. We extend our deepest sympathies to the Dropkin children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. 
Amokum Yenachim is Chem Beso Shar of Ele Tzion Yerushalayim. May the many, many memories of all her good deeds be a source of comfort to all of the mourners. And now I would like to have my wife Vivian, who was such a close friend, and uh, to say a few words. To my dearest Dropkin family, I'm saddened that we have to meet again at such an occasion but I'm happy of all the years that we shared so many wonderful memories together. One of the greatest things that Corky and I experienced together was to be very close friends. That's one of the greatest gifts that a person can receive. And I think it's the legacy that she would have wanted you to have as children, to understand the beauty and importance of having a very good friend, and also the legacy of how she enjoyed the rituals and the wonderful holiday times of our relationship together on Shabbat and holidays. Those are the memories that she wanted to leave you with to remember her happy times, her vitality, her vivacity, and her goodness. And if, if, she, if you remember anything, please remember the legacy she would have wanted you to remember. I wish that God will heal your sadness, but also to remember the wonderful vitality and joy and the resources that your parents brought out in the Jewish community. And that is part of your legacy. And I wish you well, and I wish you comfort. I can't say anything more. Thank you both, Dr. Skolniks. And now, daughter Ruth would like to share some thoughts with us. The living mother-daughter relationship you learn over and over again is a constant choice between adaptation and acceptance. I find the relationship between mother and daughter to be quite complex and extraordinarily deep. I say this as a daughter and a mother of a daughter. In many ways, I am more like my father than my mother. And as a child, I know this caused my mother a bit of concern she wanted me to be colorful and outgoing, forever positive, never angry, always dressed with absolute color coordination and tactfully matching accessories. By my nature, I was not of that persuasion. I wanted to cause as little tension to myself as possible. I wanted to analyze life to the smallest nuance, to admit negativity exists. I wanted to wear quiet colors plain hairstyles, and small jewelry. I am by nature a bit of a loner, and my favorite childhood activities revolved around reading, schoolwork, playing the piano, and listening to music. But she wanted a partner in crime, someone to ooh and ah with her over a big hat. And I couldn't give her that. I don't say this in anger or as criticism of her or as a woe is me. It was a fact that we both had to come to terms with over time. She to accept me as I was, she to accept the belief that she wanted the best for me, and yes, to accept her as she was. And yet I still consider her a bit of an enigma. As positive, outgoing, flirtatious, and flamboyant as she was, from the time I was a child, I truly believe she kept quite a bit of suffering deep inside that she never would reveal. At some point, I finally let that be 
and stop trying to get her to admit her suffering. I mean, no one could possibly be that positive all the time, <laughs> but she was. And yet I can honestly say I grew to admire her and secretly carry hopes to be a bit more like her every day because she wore it well. We both came full circle and learned to adapt and accept each other. And I am forever grateful that we spent the last 13 years in that mode. I am thankful I truly got to know her as much as she would let me know to realize her strength, to appreciate her naughty sense of humor, her giving nature, her service to others and causes, her insistence on sending people greeting cards, no matter what the occasion, her ability to get people to like her right off the bat, her capacity to adapt to any tragic situation that befell her, and there were many over the years. I was in awe at her skill at accepting things as they are, to take one day at a time, to not dwell on the negative, and to age with grace. And yes, I even grew to appreciate her big hats. She used to tell me that I would understand her better when I had a daughter of my own. It took a while, but I can honestly say after raising a daughter that I know understand so much better where she was coming from. I was eventually in the last years able to tell her these things, to let her know I loved and appreciated her because much of the childhood, my childhood, I was unable to do that for her. I am so thankful and grateful that I had that chance and the chance to have my last words to be to her to be, I love you, mom. Her lessons on how to live happily and with meaning on this earth will continue to inspire me for the rest of my life. And her memory, memory will be a perpetual blessing to my family. I love you, Mom. And now son David would like to say a few words. In this week's Parsha, we read Devarim, chapter 26, verse 11. It says, V'samachta v'chol hatov Asher natam lecha adonai lohecha levetecha ata v'halevi v'hager asher v'kirbecha. And you shall rejoice in all the good which God, your God, has given you and your house, you and the Levite and the stranger that is in the midst of thee. Ad. Now this week we read something so rep that so represents what my mother lived. That we should celebrate all the good that Hashem has given us. That was my mother's view. That we are given good in our lives and we should celebrate that. But sometimes things are not so good and we need to celebrate that also. My mom taught me that. She instilled in me the ability to look at a situation and decide how I was going to feel about it. We would talk about this often in our almost daily phone calls, what was going on in our lives and how we decided to feel about it. My mom decided many years ago that she would celebrate life as much as she could. She did this even in the midst of my dad's long illness and later her declining health. She refused to sit around and complain about the various aches and pains she encountered. That was her main reason for not wanting to move to High Point. She found a way to celebrate the good about High Point, and there was much good to celebrate. The last 13 years of her life have been amazing. I want to thank Trish Cohn and her staff, and Debbie Zemmel before Trish and her staff, for all they did for our mom. I did not know until recently that my mom had a nickname for me. My sister <laughs> called me Mr. Sunshine. I had no idea. I asked her about it when I found out. And she said it was because I looked at life the way she taught me. Find the positive in everything. 
even in things that appear negative. Now I come to the hardest part to find a positive lesson in her passing. I'm working on that. I pray that her soul is bound up with the souls of my father, my grandmother, and my uncle. They taught us well, and it will be their lessons that guide us into the future. Yes, she is not in this physical world with us any longer, but she lives on in the memories of all those she touched. I celebrate each time someone tells me that she invited them to Shabbat dinner, or that she sent them a birthday card. What she did during her life created untold opportunities for us to celebrate the good that Hashem gave her. And now son Noah would like to share some thoughts. Okay. Let's see if we get through this, huh? Uh, I thought when John Prine died of COVID back in April that this is about as bad as it could get. Turns out I was wrong. The other night, my wife Lisa hugged me. She comforted me and she said, Mom was a good person, a warm person. She made other people feel loved. I don't know how many daughters-in-law you know, in the course of history would say that. I think that was my mom's mission in life, to make other people feel loved, to show them that they had value and worth. She wasn't naive. She knew the world was an imperfect place and not every expression of goodwill would be reciprocated, but that didn't hold her back for a moment. Mom was forever inviting people over to our house for Shabbat dinner, young people in college, medical school, law school, who had no one local to welcome them. I will admit that being the youngest of four, maybe I felt there wasn't a lot of attention to go around by the time I arrived, though my siblings will tell you that I figured out how to game the system. And there were times that seeing stranger after stranger walk in our door got on my nerves though I did meet some really interesting people over the year, and a few are here today. But now looking back, I know my mom made an impression, a positive impression on each person that she encountered. There are marriages she had a hand in setting up, a cousin of ours she cured of his fear of elevators. There are many, many examples we could share. Our mom didn't have an observant upbringing and very little Jewish education in the traditional sense. The rabbis taught that God imparted the Torah to Moses by divine dictation. And even though mom never read this growing up, I can tell you that some spirit beyond us all dictated this passage to mom. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you like a citizen of yours, and you shall love him as yourself, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Welcoming the stranger is one of the most well-known principles in Jewish tradition, and I'm glad mom never wavered in her dedication to doing so. So let me close with my mom's own words that she conveyed to a photographer last summer. The photographer, Heidi Wagner, was doing a project she called the Passions Project. She wanted to share images and stories of older people and the beauty that comes from time and wisdom. Mom was one of her subjects and her passion was volunteering, most recently at the High Point gift shop in Milwaukee, which is where Heidi photographed her. In order to make yourself feel better, you have to give back something. Be grateful for what you have. I'm very lucky, she said. I have wonderful children. If you have about a year and a half, I could tell you about them, she said. Today was our turn to tell you about mom. And I expect that we will be spending much more than a year and a half talking about her and how she gave something back.
Noah, I would only add that your wife Lisa is a daughter in love, not in law. You know, as I listen to all those honest and emotional remarks, I have to share something with you. I have family in Israel, and you know, right before the COVID, they came over, and everyone who came over wanted to see the play Hamilton. So I got to see it three times. And for those of you who have seen the play, you know that one of the themes of the play is how to transmit your legacy. And there's a verse that goes through the entire play. Who lives, who dies, who will tell your story, who will keep your flame, and who will remember your name? Ruth, David, Noah, Zach, you will tell her story you will keep her flame, and you will always remember her name. I would ask those who can to please rise. El mole rachamim shalchein bamromim hametzei menucha nechona tachat kanfei ashachina b'maalot kedoshim utohorim kezoar horakia masirim et nishmat karindrapkin shalachali olamo. Bogan Aden Tahi Minucha Ta Anabal Parachamim Hasti Reha Besater Kenafecha Liolamim Utsror Bitsror Achayim Et Nishmata Aranoi Hunakalata Betanuach Bashalom Al Mishkava Venomar Amen. El Mole Rachamim, O exalted compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the soul of Karin Korki Dropkin who has gone unto her eternal home. O merciful one, we ask that she find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May her soul be bound up in the bond of life. May she rest in peace. And as one united family, let us answer. Amen. And just before we conclude the service, I would like to share with you two Jewish traditions. The first is that we have a belief in our faith in the resurrection of the dead. And it's in one of our most important prayers three times a day. And according to tradition, those who will rise first are those who were buried either in the Mount of Olive Cemetery in Jerusalem, which is our holiest cemetery, or under earth from the Mount of Olive Cemetery. So in a moment, I will place some earth from the Mount of Olive Cemetery onto Corky's casket. Second, is that we have a very powerful and poignant tradition that we don't allow strangers to bury our dead. So at the very conclusion of the service, I encourage each and every one of you to symbolically participate in Corky's burial. It is the last mitzvah. It is the last good deed that you can do for Corinne Dropkin without asking anything in return or expecting anything in return. Any way to participate is fine. I will demonstrate the traditional way, which is to do three small shovelfuls with the first shovel turned in the opposite direction as a sign of grief, and then two in the normal direction. And we do it three times because the first could be by accident, the second could be by coincidence, but the third is a real commitment. Now the origins of our mourner's prayer called the Kaddish, meaning holiness, are very mysterious. Angels are said to have brought it down from heaven. It is the only prayer in our faith that has the power to link the living and the dead. But interestingly enough, if you look at the English translation, there's absolutely no mention of death in the mourner's prayer. Therefore, it causes us to focus on the blessings of life and no one was more a blessing in all of our lives than Corky Dropkin. It's in your booklets, and please join along with me for our traditional mourner's prayer. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah v'yolma divra chirutei v'yamlich machutei v'chai chon v'yomei chon v'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael Bagala Uvizman Koriv Vimru Amen. Yahesh Me Rabba Mavarachli Olam Olameo Maya. 
Yitbarach, Vyishtabach, Vyitbar, Vyit Romam, Vyit Nase, Vyit Adar, Vyit Ale, Vyit Alal, Shemei de Kudisha Brechu, Leela Min Kol Berchata Vishirata, Tush Berchata Venechemata, Da Miran Bioma, Vimru Amen, Yehe Shlom Araba Min Shemaya Vachayim, Aleinu Vial Kol Yisrael, Vimru Amen, O Se Shalom Bimromav, Huya Ase Shalom, Aleinu Vial Kol Yisrael, Vimru Amen, may the good Lord who makes peace in the high heavens grant peace and comfort to all of us who remember and mourn Corky, and again as one united family. Let us answer. As the rabbi mentioned, everybody will have an opportunity to place some earth into the grave. Just please watch your step as you approach the grave as the ground is uneven. Secondly, due to COVID, we ask anybody who's going to participate, we have a box of gloves there to please put on a pair of gloves before you touch the shovel and then we'll take the gloves from you. The family has a Zoom shiver later on today. That information is on our website, chicagojewishfuels.com, and there's a link on there to the Zoom for anybody to log on for the shiver.
Shovel, we ask you to take a pair of gloves. garbage can here, you can throw out your gloves when you're done. Thank you. 
No one wants to go so Gentlemen, this concludes the service, sir. You may return to your cars. To exit the cemetery, we're going to go straight down and then you'll make a right.